thank you very much. I'm very happy to speak in this session that I'm already imposed by all these really interesting talks. Um, so my paper is a joint paper with the Finnish archaeologist Kerko Nordqvist, who can unfortunately not be here. Um, and the title is Terms Make History, How Denkstile Shaped the Neolithic. And here's a picture of Kerko. <laughs> um, so we will uh, first have a little look at um, the term Neolithic again. So what is the Neolithic? And we will specifically look at the sort of East-West dichotomy here. Um, and the co and the problems which uh, arise from the non-concurrent understanding of this term, uh, we will look how uh, um, solutions for this problem were sought um, based on the example of the region of the Eastern Baltic. Um, we will then uh, take a little step back and uh, look uh, on a more theoretical basis on the epistemological impact of different Denkstile on this whole uh, conundrum. And then uh, we would like to take a global view to get beyond the music before a little outlook. So you all are aware that this term Neolithic is a very um, diverse <laughs> term which uh, encompasses in different regions, in different schools, in different ways of thinking, very different things. So we uh, randomly choose some, some examples here. Uh, Bernhard Gramsch from the GDR said it's Urgesellschaft of Bäuerlicher Grundlage. Um, or we have uh, Chris Fowler and others saying the Neolithic is a form of social organization predicated on distinctive relations with things, places, and animals, competitive communities, and wealth. Um, or we have the Russian definition, which is prevailing, uh, uh, exemplified by a quote by Svetlana Oshipkina. Therefore, only the ceramic vessels remain as an indicator for the determination of Neolithic monuments, their appearance, that marks the beginning of the Neolithic. So quite negative sort of reductionist way of looking at it. Um, but uh, one of the most important and uh, from a European perspective prevailing uh, definitions, I have no, now a German quote here, is the one based on the productive economy. So Siliane Schaal, for example, defines the period as die Epoche, in der die produzierende Wirtschaftsweise einsetzt und sich schließlich auch durchsetzt. So, uh, if we if we sort of systematize these different, it's very different approaches, maybe a little bit from a European perspective. This uh, term of revolution, of course, is the core of our session, but there's also one which is very highly problematic uh, uh, in the context of this progressivist, illusionist way of looking at history. Um, so, what about this unilinear uh, imagination of revolution? Um, then there are certain um, uh, ways of thinking about the Neolithic, as we have also seen already in the previous talks, um, which see it as a process with a series of tipping points, uh, points when developments have developed long enough to become truly significant and turn into points of no return, so that certain aspects cannot be um, <laughs> seemingly uh, be taken off again. Um, but uh, what is, of course, uh, currently also developing uh, much, much uh, more prominently are the bottom-up models, uh, which uh, take into the numerous diverse local and regional developments and trajectories. So this is sort of the field in which we can uh, currently look at this uh, problem. But what we want to take a specific look at is this uh, very, um, yeah, interpretatively big problem of the differences between what we call the Western concept and the Eastern concept if we look from a European perspective. So what most of you probably like in Britain and in Central Europe are most familiar with, with and probably also use the South, if you still use the term, would be the Western concept where the main uh, and central criterion is the invention and dispersal of agriculture and animal husbandry and or animal husbandry um, uh, as the major novelty. And then it is imagined as being accompanied by things like sedentism, social inequality, um, new craft techniques, uh, including pottery as one of the major criterion, but also certain stone working techniques like grinding, uh, stone tools and so on. 
And other aspects like monumentality would also be associated with this Neolithic bundle. The Eastern Neolithization concept is what would be the prominent way of understanding the period in the former Soviet Union and most of the areas which belong to it. And so today it would be Russia and its influence, uh, influence sorry, sphere of influence. Um, and I had already mentioned one of the quotes by Svetlana Shipkina. So here, the one and only criterion is pottery. So we have hunter-gatherer groups, and when pottery comes into their technological repertoire, they are called Neolithic. So this is, of course, rooted in the history of, of, of archaeology and the different, uh, different ideas which emerged in Europe and in America during the 19th century. But uh, since most of this uh, area of Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, would, he, would have been um, yeah, dominant, do, dominated by these northern hunter-gatherers who never took up farming, this would be the um, definition which prevails in most of this area. And then the archaeologists often try to make a real Neolithic out of it by associating other aspects with that, like new types of stone tools which emerge at the same time as pottery, or when you really look for it, you will find something, um, or an increase in pit houses, pit houses like Tanya showed earlier on, economic change, and also changes in worldview are postulated. Um, and if we take a Eurasia <laughs> on this map, we see how these two spheres of understanding the Neolithic intersect in a certain region, ranging from uh, Finland uh, down to the, yeah, let's say, northern Baltic region. And this is what we want to have a look at now in a, in a bit more yeah, detail. But first, let's have a look um, at, uh, at, at the way this, these different, per, different perceptions are constituted. And we think that the theory by Ludwig Fleck um, a now famous um, epistemologist, but also actually a microbiologist and immunologist, um, has uh, coined uh, an understanding of something which he called Denkstile, a Denk collective, which we think is actually very important to bear in mind for understanding this problematic um, terminological situation and conceptual situation. So, just a few words on Fleck. He um, he is like a predecessor of Kuhn, who's much better known, actually. But uh, much of the thinking of Kuhn is based, actually, on Fleck, and Kuhn also admits that. Um, he, was, uh, he was a Polish scholar living in Lemberg in Lviv, which is now Lviv. Um, and then also uh, um, got, uh, well, his biography was interrupted then by the Nazi period, and he ended up in Auschwitz and then emigrated to Israel. Um, but what he did is he wrote a very important uh, book um, about uh, this, this um, concept of Denk Kollektiv uh, and Denkstil and how they shape, how scientists can approach their topics and how they can think and interpret their um, issues. So just to introduce these two important um, uh, concepts, Denk Kollektiv, which we could just say a thought collective maybe, uh, is a community with similar education and ideological background on certain fields of knowledge, sharing similar ways of thinking, um, directed perception, he calls it, um, uh, for example, in the way of having these Denkstile thought styles. And the Denkstile are highly persistent as essential as the essential beliefs and patterns of action included in the mindset are self-evident. Changes of your primary, primarily only through intergroup communication of members of different Denk collective. Yes, and, and uh, these sort of ways of thinking were also then cited and incorporated in Thomas Kuhn's uh, yeah, paradigms concept. So let's bear this in mind. Um, so in this Eastern Baltic region, where these two ways of looking at the neolithic understanding is intersect, the archaeologists, of course, are aware of that problem. And but in order to have a sort of adequate tools to describe and understand what they are studying, they have been trying to find solutions for this conflicting sort of way of looking at the Neolithic. And we want to show you a couple of examples for that. So one way would be to find compromise levels in the traditional zone. 
So in Finland, you have the term sark Neolithic, pottery Mesolithic. In Russia, you have yes, Neo Neolithic, the forest Neolithic. Um, in Lithuania, of sub Neolithic and Poland para Neolithicum, and in Poland also Proto Neolithic. So you see this, they are struggling with the terms. A second approach, how to deal with this problem, um, it is best, yeah, would be to search for early agriculture. So if we don't have agriculture, we find the gatherers and the pottery, let's look for the agriculture to make it a proper Neolithic. So this is also to be found prominently in Baltic literature and also in Finnish literature. Here we show you two examples. Um, the author actually. One is uh, early farming in the northern warrior zone, reassessing the history of land use in southeastern Finland through high re resolution pollen analysis with all the problems of finding cereal pollen in the uh, pollen diagrams. Or um, then an answer which deconstructs this approach rightfully, we think, deconstructing the concept of sub Neolithic farming in the southeast Baltic by Gutes Pilitskowskas and his colleagues. A third way is the postulation of two types of the Neolithic, which I actually personally find almost, almost most problematic. So uh, the prominent Russian archaeologist Vladimir Timofeev, for example, divided an agricultural and non-agricultural forest Neolithic, saying that both types of the Neolithic can be regarded as different phenomena of one and the same process, which process this is supposed to be, he doesn't say. Pavel Dalokhanov, a prominent Russian scholar who's known in, in the Anglophone world because he wrote in English and lived in England, um, wrote, this leads us to suggest that the Neolithic as a pan-European phenomenon resulted from at least two processes, <coughs> one of which involves primarily farming and another pottery making. The two processes had entirely different centers of origin and were not simultaneous. So the term makes history here, if you can. Uh, see that. Um, so they first have the term and then they understand based on the term what is happening, has been happening in history. And Yaroslav Kuzmin, another Russian scholar writing in English, actually has uh, rightfully deconstructed this way of looking at it, saying the mixture of European as a Neolithic coincides with the beginning of food production and Asian Neolithic comes along with pottery, con concepts of the Neolithization and attempts to model simultaneously the spread of agriculture from the Levant to Europe and the fusion of pottery making from East Asia towards Eastern Europe led to confusion because two different criteria of the Neolithization, agriculture and pottery, are lumped together. So I think that's exactly what it is. And the one doesn't have to do with the other, only in our yeah, concepts. And the third way, which is mainly done based on political reasons, uh, in the Eastern Baltic states is the revision of the periodization from the Soviet periodization to the um, Western periodization. That's what Ivar Kiska, for example, did with the pottery bearing and the gatherers who used to be Neolithic, and now in his new writings they are part of the Mesolithic period, as yeah, reflecting what we have in the uh, West. And the four F is six, oh sorry, the fifth type is to look for major innovations again to uh, yeah, justify the Neolithic change. For example, the postulation of an aquatic Neolithic. That would be one of the ways of emphasizing the sort of novelty of production. So uh, we, what we see is the epistemological impact of this different dimension from the different academic schools. Um, and these solutions, which I just presented, bear, of course, several problems. First of all, we have a present and a past. So the cultural historical meaning is assigned to classificatory and terminological problems of archaeologists and turn them into parts, and that's the most problematic thing of the archaeological narratives themselves. Then, of course, we have this, uh, this, this thing of, uh, of this underlying yeah, thing of the West European or Anglican supremacy, so that the uh, Western European farming is still taken as the irrefutable fact and as the main yardstick that some of those uh, solutions were re reflecting that. Nationalism plays a role, as we also have seen in different uh, talks today already, uh, for example, in Martins. <laughs> and values, uh, so that terminology often carries heavy baggage of values and the legacy of the 21st century post-Enlightenment rationale 
that concept. So cultivation in the process is best versus hunting gathering and make works in eastness. Um, what is most problematic is that in these, uh, this epistemological impact is actually influencing the research itself. One very notorious example is this paper. Uh, the neolithic tradition in the Baltic was not driven by a mixture of early uh, European farmers, like a very prominent uh, peer-reviewed paper. But what stands behind that is, yes, because the neolithic in the Baltic is defined as hunter gatherers of country, so no farming yet. And yeah, so this is what happens. And the other thing, uh, again, is what we already mentioned, uh, an aquatic neolithic is searched for. We are searching for it. The, the research is funded to search for it. So it really affects it. And the terms make the history. So what we need to do is look more diversely and globally. Um, and since I have to come to the end, let's have just a brief look of all these uh, larger developments and the diversity across the planet, which is well documented, of course, only not very well cited mostly. Um, and we can look at America, for example, where, where we have the same different traits appearing at completely different sequences, and there's no need to think defined. It's a completely different terminology, and so the thinking works also differently. Um, so we need regional studies and uh, bottom-up approaches um, in order to uh, understand the periods of change in all these different areas, not only from an economic, but uh, from a wider uh, perspective. Um, the Neolithic is no global horizon, and the existence of postulated packages must be proven case by case. And so we would look relativistically at that and think, why should we study the Neolithic at all? So, um, so we um, want to we want to stress that we have to acknowledge the differences and be aware of that of these different Denkstile and Denk Kollektive in the different areas. We have to think about more about terminology and how to use it, which we already do in this session, of course. We need to find more neutral terminology for a more holistic and more objective and value-free, if possible, as of course not possible, examination of the past and uh, exit uh, from the constraining boxes of these Denkstile through the discussion among each other uh, uh, and with the members of different Denk collective. We would have liked to do this further with our Russian colleagues if we do. Um, at least from afar, because otherwise terms will continue to make history. Thank you.